Welcome to another episode of Leadership Gems. My name is Bernd Vogel. I'm the founding director of the Hende Center for Leadership and a professor of leadership at the Hende Business School. Today's episode of Leadership Gems are with Steve Babeko, CEO and founder of Extreme Group, a number of businesses located in Nigeria and beyond. Hello Steve, welcome to Henley. Thank you, Ben. Lovely to be here. I must say the place is really beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Um, a real pleasure to, to have you around and, uh, and having a chance to explore a bit around your ideas on leadership, uh, yeah. which is our interest in the Henley Center for Leadership. Um, let me start with the first question. Mm. Right? When you look back at your career, when was the time that you thought what I'm doing, you know, what I'm involved uh, in actually looks like leading or leadership? Well, honestly, I'm going to break my response into like two parts, you know, uh, maybe f the first part I'll try and go as way back as possible. Uh, I'm the first child in a family of six, so as the first born in Africa, you just automatically have leadership thrust upon you, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not, you know, so, I mean, immediately I got my first job, I had my siblings already living with me, so uh, with the little salary I was getting at the time, my job was to ensure that we had enough food, there's enough gas to cook, and just the fact that I could then apportion a little bit of responsibilities to my siblings to make sure that we were able to go without starving at any time, I think, if I think back, that would be my first mm -hmm. uh, encounter with leadership then if I fast forward a little bit to to the business I remember I joined I had my first job as a copywriter in 1995 and six months into that job I went to the finance guys to say to ask one question that obviously had had not been asked by too many creatives at the time how are we doing actual numbers versus forecast and the jaw of the finance guy was on the floor somewhere out of shock to say, look, you're a creative, I've been here. Even your creative director has never come to ask us, why are you asking? I said, well, I just want to know if we are behind, then I know I have to double down on some of the briefs that get to my table and work faster. And if we're ahead, then I know I can take things easy. So I think that in itself, I may not have a position of leadership, but I already started taking responsibility, which is part of leadership. So I, I say from then on, I started to feel a sense of responsibility in the organization. And believe me, I think that's what leadership is all about. Mm -hmm. oh, that, that, that's, that, that's interesting, you know, from an early start to mm -hmm. then surprising, right? Yeah. Others is, is, part, is part of that. Um, we often interested in, in, you know, there's a lot of conversation on leadership. We're interested, you know, what's actually the, the purpose of leadership? You know, mm -hmm. we, we say leadership for mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. right? And so what do you want to achieve with leading, with you engaging mm -hmm. in, in leadership? Uh, from from where I see it, what I think the purpose of leadership is about, because leadership cannot be just for the sake of leading. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, leadership should be able to inspire great followership, right? So uh, someone once said, uh, I can't remember the name of the person, that if you are leading and you turn back and look behind you and nobody's following, you're not leading, you're just taking a stroll. So, I mean, <laughs> so at that point, the purpose of leadership will be to inspire greatness in the followership and by extension, create new sets of leaders so that there will be continuity. So for me, I think, uh, I struggled with my purpose for a long time. I used to wonder, why am I here? Mm -hmm. I woke up one day, opened my eyes, and I found myself in this dimension. Why? And I used to struggle with that until I think I finally worked it out that I'm here, God, God, the universe has given me a platform, and my purpose is to make that platform available mm -hmm. for the next coming generation so that they too can discover their own purpose. And for that, from that moment on, I tell you, I breathe a lot easier because I know the purpose of leadership is to breathe new sets of leaders mm -hmm. and, and how do, so, so and, and how does that you know inform then your behavior right and, and, what, and what you do well it, it, it does a lot so even when uh, I take people through that funnel and they come and share my platform and then they become great and then they move on 
if before, if it was before I finally happened on this idea of using that platform mm -hmm. to breed greatness, the tendency is for you to become upset to say, oh, you just lost people. But whether we are on a good time with the people who left or we are not on such a great time, it's mission accomplished for me. So that has affected my behavior a lot to understand that I'm just a conduit in this whole process. My job is to make sure that I create that right of passage for the guys who are coming behind. They get on that platform and off of that they leapfrog. So uh, I, I feel very humbled by it that I have that sense of just the privilege to be able to like uh, breed new sets of leaders for that, the for the future. That that is fascinating. We had just on Saturday a group in, but we exactly discussed that question mm -hmm. and we did a study. Um, around the future of leadership and we figured that there's something like episodic loyalty sure, that sure. we need to actually give people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and then this, these are lifelong partnerships mm -hmm. that we have mm -hmm. and, and they have their own cause. Mm -hmm. and, and we, it's interesting to use the word of conduit. Yes. Right? I, I like that. And then there's the opposite where they say, well, actually, it's a loss if someone is leaving. Yes. Completely different world <laughs> between you, right? Yeah. You know, it seems that you made a tra transition sure, there to sure. think, um, now that, that is fascin mm -hmm. fascinating, and I think many more managers go into, into, into that area. If you look beyond your organization, mm -hmm. you know, um, you, the, the two organizations that you're particularly involved with, so what other things do you like to impact with leading? Well, I think it's, again, empowerment, you know, it's a, it's, it should be a natural consequence of leading. And there's something that uh, the, the former president of the United States, Barack Obama, said that uh, I'll carry my, with me to, to the next dimension that I go to. And he spoke, I think, around 2011 uh, in some uh, town hall meeting about shared responsibility, shared prosperity. And I think shared prosperity should be a natural consequences, a natural, natural consequence of good leadership. So how do we take responsibility? Because leadership it's in itself. Yes, you might be the arrowhead of the leadership structure, but you can never lead all by yourself. You need mm -hmm. some set of lieutenants and generals that are supposed to help prop up that whole vehicle for it to keep moving, right? But then, having done that, how are you able to create shared prosperity that will be a consequence of the, the onerous job of leading an organization? I think that is where sometimes most leaders tend to miss the mark, mm -hmm. you know, because now having created the wealth, how do you make sure that everybody is a particular in that shared prosperity level? I think I take that very seriously. Ah, that, so, so this idea of sharing, you know, responsibility also needs to be sharing with the gain. Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. and gain in the broadest sense. Absolutely. That, that's interesting. I like mm -hmm. to explore this mm -hmm. sharing a bit further. So mm -hmm. who do you lead with? Ah, interesting, because the thing is, you, you want, as a leader, first start leading with yourself, mm -hmm. because I think identifying your North Star and creating that vision and direction for the organization is very crucial for every leader. But having done that, how do you carry the next level of leadership along because one, you must be able to sell the vision to them and must be able to, because that's how it starts to percolate and, and, and go down to the entire floor of, of, of the organization. So it is first, most, first and foremost yourself and then the next line of leadership you have, you, it, it's a journey that you must do together hand in hand so that once you've identified the vision and you've established it as like this is the protocol for the organization you can go to sleep so even when you're not there you know that the next line of leadership will see this thing and they know where we're headed it's like finding your direction on google map right it's be, it's all been plotted the route has been plotted and it's on this app so it doesn't matter where you are you just need to key in the keyword mm -hmm. and then you find your direction i think that is very crucial for every organization um, you know meredith parker followed calls that purpose as the invisible leader mm -hmm. right the moment yeah. you have an yeah. established yeah. direction yeah. It actually works when yeah. when do you know because that's where many you know executives and managers find yeah. it difficult when do you know to step aside and give that you know next layer how you call that the space you know because you might be used to, to stand in the limelight. So you know, people want you so to be in the limelight. Yeah, yeah. So how do you step aside and give space? 
I, I think the moment you get into the limelight is the problem. Is the moment you should start planning to mm. step aside, because you see, nothing lasts forever, right? So I mean, you're gonna have your 15 minutes, enjoy it as much as possible, because the whole purpose of leadership is to be able to engender continuity. There's no continuity without the purpose of leadership is defeated if continuity is yeah. not imbued into it. So. Uh, from day one, I mean, we started working on succession planning in our organization, so that including myself, we always worried about who is going to replace who. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, let's even assume you you become stubborn and obstinate, and you you pull out a Mobutu or any of these sit out sit tight African leaders, respect to them, and you refuse to quit the limelight. What if you drop dead? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge business risk. <laughs> so, so that key man risk is always there, which is why we need to mitigate against that and always look for replace, replacement at the right time. You know, that's the only way you can uh, find longevity in an organization. Mm -hmm. I, I like to come back to this uh, longevity. I'm, you know, but I'm more interested. Did you have phases where you, you make space, but people give it back to you? Sure. You know, and they basically don't pick it up. Or what, you know, because that happens, right? And what do you do then, you know, when they want to redelegate, basically, you know, <laughs> things, you know, Steve is taking care of it, sure, I don't sure. want to, so how do you then get them there to actually pick up what, what you want them to grow and how you want them to grow? Actually, I think we're exactly in that same state you just mm -hmm. mentioned now, where uh, sometimes it's this uh, Jamaican myth about the children of Sisyphus, where Sisyphus was forever cost of pushing mm -hmm. the rock up the mountain and the rock will always slip back. So it, you see that happen a lot in organization. As I two, three years ago, we had hired somebody uh, who was ex-Google, and my, I was so uh, beholden by his leadership capability, and he came, took the, to, to the organization like duck to water, and I'm like, see, the one that the prophet spoke about is here now, so I can at least begin to step back. And he worked for, with us for like six to nine months and had other vision to do some other things. No. Okay, so now, we're still friends till today. He's a wonderful gentleman, but it takes the entire system back again. We had to rebuild, re-strategize, because again, getting the right people on the bus is so crucial. If you get it wrong, it could mean the demise of the organization itself. So we started, we hired someone else who, we, we missed the queue, we didn't see it. it, turned out to be a major disaster, you know. <laughs> so we had to shake hands with the guy. Now I'm back to strategizing to get somebody else uh, in place. So it's, it's gonna happen once in a while, but the thing is, uh, just hang in there, you have to keep pushing that rock up the mountain until mm -hmm. you get it right. Yeah, you know. yeah that, that's interesting because I, I think that, that there's, uh, there's you wanting to hand over, sure, sure. But, but you know, do people you know pick this up? Absolutely, you know? absolutely. And, and in, term, in terms of the longevity, um, so, so what are your time frames there that you think you know with your you know businesses with your uh, initiatives? You know, what, what is your thinking there? I had always thought since we started. I always told my people by the time the organization turns ten. I'm out. Mm -hmm. You know. How are we doing on the ten? Uh, I can say not so good. <laughs> not so good. I think we're like fifty percent there because, mm -hmm. uh, which is not good. Uh, by now, I think we should be getting to eighty or ninety percent in terms of, yeah. But because we've had a few setbacks, we we had to recalibrate and start. Uh, we're going to be ten August one. Uh, so I'll say I give myself another one year to two years max, then mm -hmm. uh, I have to find a way to step aside. And, and for your organization, you know you're in the advertising industry with one of your businesses, and mm -hmm. the, the second in the music business, but on the advertising business. So, so what's your thinking for the business? Is that a, you know, think about a hundred year scale or a 25 year you know, scale for the business overall? Oh, I think for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, what you find in most uh, from where I come from in Nigeria, I think the the oldest agency will probably be around 
40 something okay. years old i think uh shout out to inside communication they've done well but most of the legacy agencies that are older sort of have disappeared from the map you know and that's not what you want as an entrepreneur you want to set up something that will live long after yourself and because if you look at the the global north you find agencies that are like hundreds of years old and they're still thriving and doing very well and uh, th those are the kind of standard we want to set on the african continent so for me, I look as further down the road as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that, that's fascinating. If you look at you, yourself, you know, how do you evaluate yourself? You know, how do you assess yourself mm -hmm. in terms of leadership and, and, and leading? How do you do that? Well, I mean, it's a constant check. It's mm -hmm. like uh, checking your blood pressure or checking your, <laughs> your temperature. You have to constantly check, uh, are you losing people? Are you still able to inspire them? Are you still able to uh, be in that moral uh, hill where you can still uh, clearly define the vision and all of that? And like someone did say, a, a, a leader is a delay in hope. Are you still be are you still being able to give hope to you, to the team that you lead? I think those are parameters that one must uh, constantly check and evaluate so that if you're no longer able to do it, then maybe the step aside thing should be even faster than uh, earlier articulated. You know? and, and do you work with the sounding board? You know, because often you know in positions like yours, people mm -hmm. start to say it's getting very silent, mm -hmm. right? You yeah. know, and, and insular. So how do you keep your feelers out for you, about yourself? You some, somehow, if you manage to surround yourself with people who really. Uh, uh, and you've empowered them to be able to give you those opinions. They might not be the nice things that you want to hear sometimes, mm -hmm. but I think uh, just around us, we have people who, even if they are not so fortunate about it, they can, in a very jocular manner, still drop the hint. So mm -hmm. for you, it's, to, uh, it's very important to listen to what people are saying, but most importantly, to listen to what they are not saying. Because, I mean, in communication, it's not just the verbal uh, articulation of thought that is crucial. There are certain things that I look out for, what is unstated, what is understated, and then I begin to, to use those uh, as parameters to judge whether we're on the right track or not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And before you, you had your own business, you, you worked in, 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 in a number of advertising uh, businesses yourself. And how do you... Um, we call that lead upwards, right? Or inspired upwards. Mm -hmm. did, did you do that? Were you engaged? Or were you saying, not into, into this? You know, tell us a bit about that. Is, is there anything that, that you pursued? Honestly, I think uh, I had a great time uh, working in the other agencies that I worked in. Uh, uh, shout out to my boss, Mr. Lulu Akiwumi. He gave me uh, the opportunity to really uh, uh, pushed me into that leadership cadre. Mm -hmm. uh, I was with Ogilvy in Nigeria. He, he owned the company and then he seconded me to one for one to become creative director, which is when my real hands-on leadership started. And funny enough, I, I started being creative director over myself alone because we, it took time to hire the right set of people that I, I now uh, had to work with. But one thing that I noticed is that I've always had that sense of ownership. Mm -hmm. So even when I finally quit my job as creative director after seven years in one for one, I know some very younger clients who came to me to say, Steve, we heard you resigned. This is strange. I'm like, what's strange about it? And they say, this is the first time we're seeing the owner of a business resign from his business. I'm like, I don't own one for one. I'm just an employee. And they found that very shocking. So it is being able to take ownership. It is in taking ownership that you truly become a leader. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I I, I enjoyed the fact that I could take ownership. I, I, if I tell my team we're going to meet at 9 o'clock in the morning, I knew it was my job to be there by 8 o'clock. I send a message out to say, I'm here, I'll see you at 9. So all of that sense of ownership was, I think, helped me a lot, even in being able to perform uh, efficiently when I finally started my own business. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at today's, so what are the you know, leadership challenges that you see um, in your organizations or broader that you know, keep you awake at night? You know, that I hope you 
<laughs> sleep well, but you know those that are really of concern to you. What are, you know, do you have do you have any at all? Or what you if yes, please. Sure, I think it's people being able to take ownership. Mm -hmm. So I think as the generation continues to go down, as you whittle down in the, in the, in the age difference and the, the cultural difference, uh, in the social uh, nuance of, of the setup today, you see that people are just not so, quite a number of people are not interested in taking ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, again, I'm not one to say, oh, this generation is better than the other one because it's just where people living in different times, of course, you know. And uh, so that keeps me awake okay. at night, just saying that, look, I know as a leader, you're not really going to succeed unless you take full ownership. And if people choose to just be individualistic and not want to take ownership, then I, I worry about that a bit. Mm -hmm. so, so what do you mean in this case by not taking ownership? So, yeah. so if we, so, so maybe others find that as well, sure. you know, or find the opposite. So yeah. what are the indicators when it doesn't work? Because if you, if you take ownership, then that is the point you start to drive the business or whatever leadership position you find yourself, you start to act like you truly own the business mm -hmm. because again the, the the policy we try to push is this joint ownership because which is why at the end of every year if there's profit we are all joint particular in sharing the profit including the security guard at the gate because we all took joint responsibility so i think ah, there's a little bit of off the mark in terms of grading how people step up to the plate to take full responsibility and take full ownership in terms of driving the business forward, you tend to see them want to stay in their little corner and just uh, just mess me with the whole responsibility thing. I think that's a bit worrisome. That, that's interesting. We ran recently a program that was, you know, called Think Like a GM. Sure, right? sure. Now, and, and that was not about actually progressing in your career, mm -hmm. but the idea to say, well, how do you think like as if I would be in the business sure, on those sure, footsteps? Sure, sure. And by that, you know, overcoming the right, in, you know, right so individual, mm -hmm. you know, interest, mm -hmm. which we should have, but also you're part of a bigger system, sure. right, which you can't. So, so, um, and, and that, you know, that brings me to other, another question. You very gently looked at different yeah. generations, you know, how work changes and so on. Do, do you sense that, um, you know, enormous digitization, right, different ways of working, a big debate in, in the global North Europe and, mm -hmm. and the US. Does it affect Nigeria and your work, if you look back and now look forward? Definitely. I mean, uh, COVID has even exacerbated the whole process, you know. I mean, some process we thought was going to take the next four or five years happened in the last two years, you know, in terms of like remote working and so all of that has changed the dynamics. Now you're struggling to bring people back to the office and they're saying, look, I'm not sure I really want to brave the horrendous and very infamous Lagos traffic to come to a place mm -hmm. called work. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm used to working from home and I want to keep it that way. So all of those complexities have come to compound a, 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 a very already difficult situation. So yeah, I think uh, digital way of working has, is beginning to, to, to be felt in, in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole. And do you use, um, do you, have you become a digital savvy leader, right? not in only in terms of the business model, mm -hmm. but in the way how you communicate, how you engage, you know, you want to create ownership, is, sure. is that, is digital they're helping you or hindering and how do you use that, you know, the range of things that, that we now can do? Interesting, because for me, I think if you look at the advertising industry, I'm mm -hmm. pro probably will be top on the list of the most digital savvy uh, CEOs within the ecosystem of marketing communication in Nigeria. You know, because for me, I understand that uh, a leader being a dealer in hope just goes beyond what you say and what you do. It's within, you can actually transfer that to mm -hmm. the digital space. So the kind of stuff you post, the kind of way your lifestyle you, you inject and you project also helps to still be a dealer in hope, just to tell the next generation that this is possible. So, and I know uh, with, with all of the digital tools available to us today, you can do a lot more and you can even reach more people. And, and that's why sometimes I'm not too surprised when from the blues, I get an invitation from uh, someone 
someone uh, from the Global North, oh, mm -hmm. uh, we want you to be a part of such and such project. And then sometimes I am confused at first, then I ask them, how did you find me? And they always smart say, we found you uh, <laughs> on the internet somehow. So I think it's become a very powerful tool for any leader to use today. You know. Th that, that, that's fascinating with all the pros and cons, but this is a huge opportunity, right? Definitely. And, and managers, you know, owners try to navigate that uh, at, mm. at the same time, not to navigate themselves away from the core business. Sure, but there's sure. another tension sure, sure. where how much personal brand and, and yeah. the business. So, so if you think of your industry being in, you know, advertising or your, your second venture, you know, you know, music, what is what are the key leadership challenges, you know, or capability? opportunities and gaps that you see in, 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 in what, is, what are the pressing issues for your industry? I think the pressing issue is just to be able to bridge the gap between generations. Mm -hmm. You know, so the, there's a big divide where the younger generations feel uh, hard done by, and again, understandably so, uh, especially when you're born in the times of great change like we've seen uh, in the past say, decade or so, and uh, global recession and all the other stuff that's plaguing the current generation. So I think just to be able to lead effectively, you need to be able to harmonize views of the generation. I mean, I, I, somebody was telling me about how uh, she told uh, her daughter that uh, she took only two weeks maternity leave after childbirth, and her daughter said, you are an idiot. How could you do that? I mean, your mental health and some of the other things that the, this current generation care a lot about, you know, how do you uh, interweave that into the whole big picture to make sure that there's harmony or at least a greater, a more firmer handshake across the generation. I think for me that's a crucial thing because you see it even beyond just work. You see it on the continent mm -hmm. when it comes to government and leadership. They are definitely not speaking the language of this current generation. And then when you insist on uh, just putting all the older people in charge of things and not uh, listening to the voice of a, the, the dominant yeah. <laughs> generation, then there's, it's a recipe for problem. And, how, and, and if I may ask, how do you make this work in your organization? Mm -hmm. And do you hope that, I know that you're involved in the industry sure, as well, sure. right, to, to think you know, how that how your industry can move. So how do you support that you know, connectivity coming together, mutual listening? Well, the thing is, uh, I've always been the, the kind of guy who I listen to the same music as my as my sons. My I have an 18 year old, a 16 and a 15. So that I do it more consciously to make sure that I'm still in tune with the kind of mm -hmm. music that they listen to. It, it gives us a little platform for us to be able to engage and connect, right? So it's the same thing with at work. How are you able to get off your high horse and just? go down to the level of the boys and girls and say, let's have a conversation. How do we do this better? How do we make this work better? I think it has to be a deliberate and conscious step. And in doing so, maybe begin to engage them in a much more positive way and maybe give pointed uh, suggestion to them to maybe improve on certain ideas that they have. You know, I think every time it's about still being able to come down and engage, mm -hmm. you know. So it's a key listening question, absolutely, really, you know, which, which which often we are asked to, you know, communicate. But actually, what we we were looking or people looking for in us is listening, absolutely, right, and providing the absolutely. space and, and 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 learn and unlearn as as, mm -hmm. we, as we go along. Mm -hmm. If you could, if you look back at your career, if you could do if you could undo one of your decisions or leadership activities, yeah. you know, what, what what would that be? Hmm, I think. That's, that's a very profound question. Well, it would probably be some of the one or two situations where you uh, uh, hire the wrong person. You know, I think that what it tells me now is that we need to improve the, the metrics for evaluation in saying, oh, you are fit for purpose and you can jump on the bus because for me, it's not even letting people go, knowing that, especially with the kind of uh, economy we have uh, on the continent, where one person has a job, but 50 other people are dependent on that job. So each time you cut somebody out of their job, you're 
it's affecting 50 other people. So uh, taking those decisions were painful, but they were necessary, you know. Uh, but I think where I will score myself a bit low is we shouldn't have taken those decisions in the first place if we had a much more uh, clearer and mm -hmm. articulate metrics for finding the person fit for the job in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I that, think, that, yeah. That's interesting. I think yeah. often people, you know, new positions in greater organizations, people think they take it like lighthearted sure, sure. dealing with people yeah. and bringing them on and also with the issue that, you know, you, you set them free again. But mm -hmm. I often hear that this is still one of the core difficulties, right? Exactly. You know, despite some of the headlines that you see about sure. the corporate. Yeah. It's just really, really tough because there's families, mm -hmm. there's all kinds sure. of structures. Sure. Yeah. So that, 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 that's fascinating. You know, as a final question, you know, uh, what is the leadership myth or recommendation that really gets on your nerve? And you would kind of, if I just could get that out of people's head, you know, um, what would that be? I think it's just that myth to say uh, leaders are born naturally. I mean, there are, some people just are much better at leadership than anybody, and so, so, some other set of people. I think. I think it's a whole lot of hogwash to me. Uh, sometimes you find yourself in a position where you have no choice than to lead. So do you have just that spirit, that fire in your belly to take on that responsibility and run with it? And then as a leader, how do you constantly do the self-check and the organizational check? to cost correct when you're going wrong and to constantly improve on your leadership skills. And I, I, and I did that. As I came into entrepreneurship from a creative point of view. I started as a creative person. And you find the general myth within the uh, marketing communication ecosystem that, oh, don't ever appoint a creative as a leader of a business, you know, because, oh, they, are just, they just don't know how to run the business. That used to get on my nerves a lot because, uh, and I wanted to prove that, that that is not actually a correct assumption. And so it put a lot of uh, pressure on me as a leader to say, okay, look, I realize that I'm not flying the flag for extreme ideas, my business, for just myself. I'm flying it for a whole new generation of creative people who may actually have leadership qualities in, innate in them. So that, uh, what to do that, I started going for courses. Every year I went to some school, it was mostly leadership and finance management because I knew those were my Achilles heels. I knew I had to build up on that. So I can tell you, if you are willing, if you have it in you, anybody can be a great leader. It's not like an exclusive reserve of any set of people. No, that, that is fascinating, yeah. and I think some industries, you know, are particular when sure. you look at that. So that's also fascinating mm -hmm. because it's, you, you are in real businesses, sure, right? Sure, you know? sure. And, and overcoming all our assumptions around yes. who can be a leader, who can be not. Sure. That, that's, that is fascinating. Well, thank you so, so much, thank uh, you, Steve thank Baker. You. you know, it's wonderful to have you with thank us. You. Thank you. Thank you. At the Handy Business School, at the Handy Center for Leadership. Thank it's you. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you.